Pastor, preach the word. Turn again to 1 Samuel, please. 1 Samuel chapter 1. The book of Samuel is an interesting book, First and Second Samuel, of records of different events that have happened throughout the course of the life of Israel. Just a kind of a snapshot of what happens in the life of Israel's history. The prophet Samuel, as you remember, was a prophet who anointed both Saul and also David. It's been said by many that he's the last judge and he's the first prophet. Samuel was an answer to a mother's prayer. In fact, his name means asked of God. His mother, Hannah, who was barren, asked the Lord for a child. And the Lord answered her prayer. Samuel is a pivotal figure in the history of Israel because he is the prophet that stands between the judges and the kings. He is the prophet that rebuked the sinning people of Israel. He is a prophet who lived with the high priest when he was a child. Because God gave Hannah, his mother, this gift. God gave him back to the Lord. Hannah eventually, as we see later on in the scripture, had three more sons and two more daughters. The accounts of the book of Samuel, near the beginning of chapter 1 here, that we're going to be looking at this morning, are reminiscent of that of Samson in Judges chapter 13, verse 2, and also of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1, verse 3. For both Samson and John the Baptist were answers to prayer as well. Samuel again means named asked of God and if there was a title to be assigned today today's message it would be a worthy portion a worthy portion a portion is something that is given to someone someone that is worthy and we'll see that we as Christians as born-again Christians should offer worthy portions of everything that we have to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we said before, he was a prophet. We'll see that over in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 20, just for a bit of a background of this. But 1 Samuel 3, verse 20, And all Israel, from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be the prophet of the Lord. All over Israel, from the north to the south, they knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of God. But this prophet of God, as we know, was an answer to a mother's prayer. A godly woman, Hannah, prayed for her. As we said earlier, he was a judge. 1 Samuel 7.15 the Bible says, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. 
all the days of his life. God wants us to have the discernment we need to judge between evil and good. We are living, we are living in a world today that is filled with evil. Filled with evil people. Filled with evil practices. And as born-again Christians, we need to practice discernment. And if something in our life, something around us, is evil, we need to put aside that evil, put aside that wickedness. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And we must have the proper discernment, the proper judgment all the days of our lives so that we can do what God wants us to do. We need to be encouraged because God answers prayer. God answers the prayer of this mother. Prayer is an important aspect of the lives of those in the Old Testament. It's an important aspect of the lives of us today as believers. For a moment, let's look at a few verses that deal with prayer. Because, again, Samuel is an answer to prayer. An answer to a mother's prayer. In 2 Chronicles 7, verse 12, the Bible will tell us that Solomon's prayer was answered. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, in verse 12, the Bible says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. Solomon wanted to do something very special for God. And God heard his prayer. That's why it's important for us today to pray. We have lots of prayer requests. Personal prayer requests. Prayer requests that pertain to the fellowship of believers that surround us. Prayer requests that deal with the city we live in, the country we live in. There are numerous prayer requests. But we have to be fervent in our prayer requests. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the scripture says in James chapter 5. Nehemiah was another one, another man of God, another prophet who prayed. Solomon was the third king of Israel. He prayed. He wanted to do something special for God. And God heard him. Hannah, her prayer was heard. Solomon's prayer was heard. Nehemiah, his prayer was heard in Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 11. The Bible says, O Lord, I beseech thee, let not thine ears be attentive to thy prayer of thy servant, and the prayer of thy servant who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So here in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 1, is asking, he's praying for God's mercy. In the book of Psalms, you have David praying, Psalm chapter 4, Psalm 4, verse 1. David makes his supplication, makes his prayer to the Lord. But in Psalm chapter 4, the Bible says, Psalm 4, 1. Hear me when I call, O Lord God, on my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Again, in Psalm 102, Psalm 102, verse 17, the Bible, the Bible says, 
He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. When we think of the prayer of Hannah, she, perhaps by some, may be considered destitute, not in a specific denotative sense, but in a connotative sense. She was not childless. She had no children. And children were a very important thing in the Old Testament. Children are very important in the New Testament. Children are very important today. And God will hear the prayer of those who pray to him. God heard the prayer of Hannah. And she received a worthy portion, not only from her husband, but also from the God of the universe. Another verse that talks about prayer is in Proverbs. Proverbs 15, verse 8. Again, we want to get the idea of the importance of prayer and the importance of why Hannah prayed. In Proverbs 15, and verse 8, the Bible says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Surely, Hannah was an upright woman of God, because God heard her prayer. We've already mentioned Zechariah. Zechariah is in Luke chapter 1, verse 13. In the early church, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we're reminded of how they gathered. They, were, they had a unity among each other. They gathered. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, in verse 15, Acts 1, 14, pardon me, Acts 1, 14, we're reminded that those people in the first century church the Bible says they all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. They continued in prayer. They didn't stop praying. Hannah didn't stop praying. It was a year by year prayer that she had. And God answered her prayer. In the book of Romans, we're reminded in Romans 12, 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 12. Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continue instant in prayer. And then in Philippians 4, 6. Philippians chapter 4 in verse 6. We're reminded that we are to continue in prayer. Philippians 4 and verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We should be careful for nothing. We should, we should assume nothing. We have to be continually in an attitude of prayer, always praying for what God can do in our lives. This is what Hannah, the mother of Samuel, was doing. She was continuing in prayer. She was a woman of prayer. She wanted a child. She desired a child, like all the women of her day. Like some women today desired a child. Sadly, many of the women that live in our day and age, they are seeking to destroy their children, not seeking to protect their children. Samuel was a woman, Hannah was a woman who wanted a son, who wanted a child. 
And so because of her prayer, because of God's faithfulness, because of God's mercy, he answered this lady's prayer and gave her not only one son, but by, because the way she responded to this gift that she asked of God, God gave her three additional sons and two daughters. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Samuel, Now there was a certain man of Ramoth Misophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkaniah. Now let's pause here for a moment. A certain man, very specific man. This, this is an account that's a genuine account. Scripture has to be accepted in its entirety. We don't want to take a position of having a limited view of what Scripture is. You want to, you, one must not limit Scripture. We cannot take a position of limited inerrancy, meaning parts of the Scripture are God's words, and other parts are the words of men. We cannot take a position whereby we would say, oh, I'm just going to take the part of the Bible that I like, and I'm going to disregard the part of the Bible that I do not like. The Bible says a certain man, a very specific man, this account of 1 Samuel happened. It was a genuine event that took place in the history of Israel. This man's name was Elkaniah. Elkaniah. Elkaniah, his name means God has created. That's what his name means. People in the Old Testament and sometimes in the New Testament time periods were given names that meant something. If you were here on Tuesday morning of this week, Perhaps you learned some names of some children that meant something, that mean something. But names have a specific meaning. The name of Samuel, as I said earlier, means asked of God, because that, that's what Hannah did. She asked God for something, and God gave it to her. El Elkaniah, he was the son of Jehoam. Jehoam, his name means showing pity. Showing pity. I know sometimes these meanings of these names are confusing and are complicated, but there's a specific meaning of what God wants us to understand about them. Showing pity. He was the son of Eliu, and Eliu's name means he is my God. The question we must pause today and in our world today we live in, in our society today that we live in, the question could be asked, is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of the saints that have lived throughout eternity, throughout time past, throughout the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, into the present, can they say, He is my God? There are people today that are denying the God of the universe. But yet, we have here a grandfather of Samuel, whose name means he is my God. There are many people who are running from God today, but there are some who are seeking God, who want God to be part of their life, who want God to answer their prayers. We today, those that are believers among us, we desire that God answers our prayers. I allow you, we have a big, long genealogy, not that long, but it's longer than some. Elihu, his father's name was Tohu which means lowly. 
Peru was the son of Zaf, an Ephrathite. Zaf means honeycomb. Now, when we look at these names here in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, there's also a passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 34 and 35, that has similar names. Some of the spellings are different for some of these names, but there are similar names. First Chronicles chapter 6 is a chronology of, of the Kohathites. Kohath, as you, as you know, is a son of Levi. Levi had three sons, Gershom, Kohath, and Merari. Merari. And not to get too far off our topic of the morning, but the Kohathites, they were the ones responsible for setting up and doing, responsible for doing things in the temple. And as we know, Samuel eventually did work in the tabernacle, a place where was a shelter, was a place that God gave specific instruction to Moses so that the people of God, those children of Israel, who departed out of the land of Egypt with the mighty hand of God and crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, God gave them this specific tabernacle with specific instructions to be operated, run, and managed by Levi, the house of Levi. And Aaron and his sons and descendants were the high priests. Eli, who was to be mentioned later on in this section, he was a descendant of Aaron. Verse 2 tells us that Elkaniah had two wives. Elkaniah had two wives. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. Her name means grace. And the other, and the name of the other was Paniah. Paniah's name means jewel. And Paniah had children but Hannah had no children. This is the verse, the fact that she had no children. It grieved her heart that she had no children. So she was sad for this fact because it was important in those days for a woman to have children. And she desired children so much that she would weep and she would cry. We know that the Bible tells us in verse 3, and it was a responsibility of every Jewish man to go and make sacrifices three times a year. And Hannah, I mean Elkaniah, was doing this in verse 3. And this man went up out of this city yearly to worship and sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Now Shiloh is the place where, as, as you remember, when the children of Israel came into the Promised Land, crossed the Jordan River on dry ground, just like they crossed it on the Red Sea, the Red sea on dry ground. They crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. And if you look in Joshua chapter 18, Joshua 18 and verse 1, the Bible reminds us of what happened to the tabernacle, the, the rest, the final place where the tabernacle was placed. Joshua chapter 18 and verse 1. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there and the land was subdued before them. So, in Joshua, chapter 18, Joshua came and he established and he set up the tabernacle in Shiloh. 
And that's where the tabernacle is when Elkaniah came to do and to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord. The idea of, of worshiping, you have there is value in something. He came because he knew he was commanded to come, but he knew there was value in the object of his worship, which is the God of Israel, the creator of the universe, the self-sufficient one, Jehovah God. He came to worship because there's value in worshiping God. He came to bow down to worship. What are the objects of our worship? The God of heaven, he must be the object of our worship. Everything else must be pushed away. If there are things in our life that are standing between us and God, things are preventing us from worshiping God, they need to be put aside. We must come and worship. He came to worship. He came to sacrifice. Take something of value of his, an animal from the flock, to slay it, which was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. The bloods and bulls and goats, those that, those, that blood could not take away sin. But the blood of Jesus, who only had, a sacrifice, had one sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary, that was enough to atone for us. It did not have to be a continual thing. Sadly, there are people in buildings around the world today that believe that Christ has to be sacrificed on a daily basis. Only one time the Lord Jesus Christ has to be sacrificed. Upon the cross of Calvary, he came to this world to die for us. And here the husband of Hannah, the husband of Paniah, is going to Shiloh, where the location of the tabernacle was, to worship God, to worship the Lord, it's in all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which gives us the indication that the Hebrew word behind this English word is, is Jehovah, the self-existing one. He came to worship the Lord. And if you look in the passage in Zechariah chapter 9, we'll notice that the Lord is the one that comes down upon the Mount of Olives It splits it open. And we know that that person in the book of Revelation is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming to worship the Lord, the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts, the one that goes forth to battle, the one that fights for them. Israel did not win the victory in the promised land with their own might. God is the one. God is the one that gave him that victory. And we must remember, when we have battles, when we have fights to fight, God must be the one that gives us the victory in the battle. We cannot win the battles in our own strength. We must let the battles be the Lord's. Shiloh, in fact, means a place of rest. The tabernacle of God, the, the tabernacle of God, the tabernacle of the congregation came in and rested there. They, Joshua put it and it set it up in Shiloh. And at this time, the Levite, who was part of the family of Kohath, who was part of the family of Aaron, Eli, was there. We know he's a descendant of Aaron. His name means ascension. And his, two, and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there as well. Later in the book of 
Samuel will learn that Hophni and Phinehas were not the best sons. They were not the best Levites, not the best Kohathites, not the best sons of, not the best descendants of Aaron. They were wicked sons. But they were there as well. It's not revealed to us yet in this passage, but later on we'll learn that in the book of Samuel. And again, so we have Hannah, who asked God for a son, which, and that son was Samuel. We would not have the, any of the books of Samuel, 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel, had an opportunity for this godly woman of Hannah. In this verse, verse 3, we have the husband, Elkaniah, going to the tabernacle in Shiloh. And the wives, I suspect, went with them. Verse 4, And when the time was that Elkaniah offered, he gave Paniah, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters, portions. He gave them part of something. He gave them something. They went up to the, they went up to the to worship and the sacrifice in Shiloh, and they were given something, a portion of something. Whether well, it was a portion of that which was sacrificed or a portion of something else, but he gave it to them. In verse five, the Bible tells us. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, a worthy portion. For he loved Hannah, the idea of love is to to breathe after something, to desire something. And he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Even though, even though Elkaniah loved Hannah, and I suspect he loved Paniah as well, but he loved Hannah, but he could not give her what she needed, what she wanted, what she desired. God was the one that was going to answer her prayer. Even though he gave her a worthy portion, she still was grieved. She still was saddened because God, because the Lord had shut her womb. The Lord will shut wombs, the Lord will open the wombs. We know in Samuel, I mean, that's Psalm, Psalms 127, the Bible tells us this. In Psalm 127, verse 3, the Bible reminds us exactly of this point of how God gives and God opens the room, womb. Because the Bible tells us that children, in Psalm 127, verse 3, Lo, children are an inheritance of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. The children come from God, the fruit of the womb. Now sadly, in verse 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 1, her adversary, this is Paniah, somebody who is against her, her adversary, rather being supportive, provoked her, the Bible says, and her adversary provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. This adversary, Panaya, uh, pardon me, uh, not Panaya, uh, not, uh, yeah, pardon me, Panaya, yes, Panaya. Her adversary, Panaya, was vexing her. She was causing her grief. She was mocking her, the Bible says, provoked her. She was provoking her, almost causing her to become angry, deliberately doing something to make her angry. 
So you have the two women, Paniah and Hannah, and Paniah was deliberately vexing Hannah, was provoking her so that she would become more grieved. The idea of, of making her uh, making her fret um, in verse uh, verse six. Um, th this verse, this word fret, um, or the, the Hebrew word behind the word fret, is used thirteen times in the Old Testament, and in many of those times, it's the idea of the, the passages. For instance, in um, in, this, in this book of Samuel, First Samuel two ten. Let's turn there for a moment. Two ten. This is just uh, across the page. First uh, Samuel two ten. The word fret. Verse 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. The word thunder in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 2.10 is the same as the word fret in 1 Samuel 1.6. Also, the same thing is true over in in 1 Samuel 7.10, the word thunder occurs. So the idea of fretting, fretting is a perfectly fine word, but, but she was deliberately provoking her to cause her to cry, to cause her to thunder, to get, to get some response, a negative response from her. This is what the plan of Paniah was, because Paniah had the daughters, Paniah had the sons, but Hannah... At this time in her life, had nothing. She had no sons, no daughters. And in verse 7, And as he did year by year, meaning Elkaniah, coming to Shiloh to provide sacrifices and offerings and to worship God, as he did year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, this is Hannah, so she provoked her, that's Paniah. Therefore she wept and did not eat, that's Hannah. She was so grieved and so mourned about the fact that she had no children, that she was barren, that she did not eat. When you're grieving, when you're mourning, sometimes the appetite is absent. Sometimes you don't eat for several meals, several days, when you're mourning, when you're grieving. And this was the case with Hannah. She went with her husband to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was set up to worship God. And while there, Elkanah gave her a worthy portion. But she didn't stop praying. Even though she was tormented and vexed and provoked by her adversary, by this woman, Paniah, she didn't stop praying. Today there are many things in our lives that are put there by the devil, put there by the unseen forces of evil who want us to stop doing what is right. But don't stop praying. The battle we fight is not a tangible battle. We don't fight with flesh and blood. Our spiritual weapons are not made of steel. Our spiritual weapons, we have the Word of God right here. We have prayer. 
we, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And so as Hannah was there at Shiloh, she and her family, her husband, was worshiping God, bringing sacrifice to God, a picture of, of Calvary. Hannah was praying for a very special prayer, prayer request. From a human standpoint, perhaps, that we said it's impossible. But it's God that gives us the life. It's God that does the impossible. So today, this morning, please remember that if there's something in your life, some battle in your life, some burden upon your heart that you have, let God give the victory. Because of a mother's prayer, A son was born and given to the ministry of serving God for a lifetime. One prayer of one lady changed the course of all Israeli history. Just think if all of us today would be as fervent as Hannah was, so that we would be able to receive a worthy portion, so that God would bless and God would do mighty things today for us and for those that we love. Father, thank you today for thy word. Thank you that thou hast given us these thoughts, these examples in the inscripturated word of God. Well, tell us that thou art worthy to be worshipped, to be praised, and that the sacrifice that was done upon Calvary was once for all, and it's efficient for us to receive by salvation eternal life because of thy plan. Father, be honored today in our life. Allow us to have a heart that is sensitive to thy leading and to thy will so that we might, like Hannah, be fervent in prayer despite the scoffers, despite those people that want to vex us for what we want to do. Allow us to continue praying in thy will. In Jesus' name, amen.